And I will introduce Christine Solomon, who I had the pleasure of sitting next to at the banquet one year and started chatting about her studies here at the U of M on Herisium. And it was so, so fascinating. I thought all of you would love to hear about it as well. So thank you for joining us. All right, there's a lot of stuff on the screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here to talk with all of you here in person, the first real in-person meeting um, since the pandemic. Um, and thanks to all of you joining online. Um, I'd love to talk with you about a couple of projects today. Um, some of you may remember that I, I talked about uh, another project on white nose syndrome a couple of years ago, and I'll, I'll just uh, remind you what that looked like. Um, oops. Uh, but before that, I want to tell you a little bit about what my lab group does generally. Uh, we're interested in natural products, and I'm going to talk about what natural products and secondary metabolites are. Um, but we're, we're mostly interested in isolating new chemistry, novel compounds from all kinds of microbes. We're interested in finding novel microbes, bacteria and fungi, because new microbes generally translates to new chemistry. We have projects where we're working on biological control of pathogens. So using fungi or bacteria that are alive to control disease in agriculture and animal systems. We work on human diseases, looking for new antibiotics, antifungals, anti-cancer agents from all these different microorganisms. And through all of these, we use a lens of chemical ecology to think about why and where and how different microbes, in which, in which I include fungi, are using chemical warfare in the environment and how we can use that to target finding new chemical compounds. So this is just a, gosh, there's so much up there. <laughs> um, do I need, do I need to click on those things? No, but you, no, you could close them. Yeah, Which, this one? Doesn't go any the I'll put it on the okay. uh, This was just a reminder about the last talk that I gave to the Minnesota Mycological Society, in which we were looking for new biological control agents for white nose syndrome, which is caused by a, a, a pathogenic fungus. But I'm not going to talk about this project today because you're here to learn about other fungi. Before I dive into the actual projects, I want to give a little bit of background about what I mean when I'm talking about natural products. So I use the words natural products and secondary metabolites interchangeably. These are compounds that are generally thought to not be necessary for basic cellular life, um, but they're thought to benefit the organism. Um, as a whole. Here are some examples. So maybe some of you have consumed this natural product today. <laughs> yeah. Caffeine, really popular secondary metabolite, comes from our plants. Penicillin, important antibiotic from fungi. Uh, this is one of my all time favorite secondary metabolites. It's called petrichor. It's the smell of like black dirt after a summer rain. Um, and you just, you smell that, that smell. It's from this compound. It's a terpene called geosmine. And that smell is known as petrichor. These are secondary metabolites. So when we're looking for new secondary metabolites from fungi, these are some of the questions that, that we're asking. How do fungi prevent predation? using chemical compounds. And I'm showing some examples where maybe mushrooms have been less successful at preventing predation. So sometimes you see slugs and other insects that are consuming um, the fruiting bodies of mushrooms. 
How do fungi protect themselves from chemical oxidation, from UV damage, from UV light? How do mushrooms prevent overgrowth by other species? And there's some notable examples where mushrooms are not as good at that. So if you think about lobster mushrooms, right? Lobster mushrooms are from the parasitization um, of several species of, of mushrooms by another fungus. Um, and we certainly see examples in the field of mushrooms being uh, consumed by other fungi and other microbes. For the project that I'm going to tell you about with Hericium, we have a specific hypothesis that we wanted to test, and that involved um, seeing if fungal mycelia and their fruiting bodies produce different secondary metabolites. And this is a, an idea that is, um, has been studied before in different species, um, and it, it, I think it makes a lot of sense. So if you think about the life cycle of a typical basidiomycete, there's both a fruiting body and then there is a mycelial part of its life history. And you can imagine that a fungus is going to produce different chemical compounds at different points in its life cycle. So if you think about a fruiting body, this is a delicious, you know, nutrient-filled, above-ground fruiting body and yet it generally remains unfouled. You generally don't see lots of other organisms growing on top of it. For the most part, there aren't a lot of specific grazers and herbivores that are eating them. For the mycelia that are growing underground, they have different kinds of pressures. So there are nematodes that eat fungi. There might be other insects. You can imagine it's a completely different physical and biological environment and might require different chemical compounds to protect itself or for it to consume nutrients and, and live in that underground environment. So for this project, um, this was started by two postdocs, Dr. Francois Gascht and Dr. Uh, Song Jun, and they wanted to collect mushrooms from across Minnesota. They went out to many state parks, county parks, collected all the fruiting bodies they could find, and they brought them back to the lab and tried to cultivate them. And so they cultivated as many as they could on different kinds of um, solid augers, and then they grew them, they cultivated them under different conditions. So different kinds of media, solid media, liquid medias, um, different amounts of time. You can imagine that fungi are going to go through different parts of the life cycle. They might produce different compounds at the early part of their growth versus the late part of their growth. Different temperatures, you can grow them shaking or not. It's sort of an infinite number of variables that you can modify when you're trying to uh, get these microbes, these fungi to produce different compounds. And this idea is, has a name. It's called One Strain, Many Compounds. It's called OSMAC for short. There are many, many um, scientific papers describing this as a successful method of getting microbes to produce different compounds. So before I talk about the specific Hericium project, I want to just give a basic introduction to this genus. In Minnesota, there are generally thought to be three species of Hericium, and those are shown here. So lion's mane, Hericium arenaceus, um, Hericium coralloides, and Hericium americanum. Um, and you'll note that these two were some of the winning photographs from previous MMS photo contests. So I got these from the website. Um, this one's from iNaturalist. So these are the ones that are, are pretty common in the state of Minnesota. However, Song and Francois found this specimen here. And morphologically, it looks a lot like Hericium americanum. But when they sequenced the, the ITS DNA, they found that it, it is less closely related to Hericium americanum, and it's more closely related to Abietes and H. alpestra. H. alpestra is a European species. 
And Abiatus is generally found more west of us and generally on conifers. This was grown, I think this was growing on a deciduous tree. So it seems to be a pro probably a new species. Um, and this is the, the tree that uh, Bob Blanchett and Ben Held, who are fungal biologists that they made, um, showing their relationship to these other species. So as part of this project, all the basidiomycetes that could grow on different medias were cultured on, first on a Petri dish to make sure they were pure, then they were inoculated into one of four different kinds of solid media. So soy, malt, rice, and Cheerios. Cheerios is an oat-based um, breakfast cereal. Turns out it is a fantastic substrate for many fungi. And what makes it so good? Well, we don't know exactly, but um, it probably has to do with the shape. There's some air pockets in there. We um, add some additional glucose to this, but we don't use honey nut Cheerios. So that's important. <laughs> So, and, and it has to be brand name Cheerios. It doesn't, apparently it doesn't work quite as well with like generic Cheerios. So you have to use brand name Cheerios. Um, these were all cultured for about a month at room temperature. They were extracted. Those extracts were tested in a number of different assays. Different compounds were purified and then we determined their structures. So I know that this is kind of a complicated slide, but I just want to walk you through this particular data set. So each of these lines here tells you where this extract came from. So for example, the fruiting body here is this first one, this sort of um, darker blue color. The Cheerios controls, that's just Cheerios alone. The mycelia growing on Cheerios, rice alone. Mycelia growing on rice, malt, soy, and then um, since soy is a liquid media, this is the soy template. And what this analysis is, is a, it's um, a chromatogram. So this is where we take a crude extract. So we take that mycelia growing on the Cheerios, we extract it with a chemical solvent, we concentrate it down and we inject it into a liquid chromatography machine. And all this is telling us is each of these peaks probably represents one or more compounds. So by looking at the pattern of these peaks, we can see what things are in common. We can see where there's large peaks, small peaks. We can see that, for example, there are very few things in common with the fruiting body. So just at a glance, this tells me that the fruiting body makes some chemical compounds. The mycelial cultures make some different compounds just by looking at this pattern of these peaks. When we purified, or sorry, when we tested these extracts, we tested all of these extracts, mostly against human pathogenic um, strains. So different kinds of drug-resistant bacteria, drug-resistant yeast. Only the Cheerios culture showed activity significant activity. And that activity was primarily against candida, candida albicans, and cryptococcus neoformans. These are important yeast pathogens in humans. Um, so that's compound four. It's this very simple chlorinated metabolite. It was not found in the fruiting body. It was only found in the mycelial culture grown on Cheerios. It wasn't found under any other condition. And that's shown here. So this peak number four with the asterisk, that's this compound that's antifungal. The other interesting thing about this kind of activity was that when we grow pathogenic fungi in the lab, we generally grow them in planktonic phase. That means that they're growing in liquid and they're just sort of scattered throughout the liquid. But in a lot of human infections, Pathogens don't grow in planktonic phase. They're often associated with the surface as a biofilm. And so we have an interest in trying to prevent or disrupt pathogenic biofilms. And this compound was only a little bit good at killing planktonic yeast, but it was really good at inhibiting biofilms. So it prevented a cryptococcus biofilm. And so that was sort of the interesting and significant activity 
of this extract. But something else I want to call your attention to is that we also isolated um, just one compound, which is here, the number nine, and this is an aranacine. And the aranacines are the, the compound that is responsible for most of the activity that, that many of you are probably interested in when it comes to pericium fungi. And I'll show you an example of that. So this is a lot of words, but I'm gonna to try to interpret it. So this is one of the early papers that was published on the aranacines. These are just examples of some of the aranacines that were first isolated from Pericium aranaceus. And this study looked at a extract from Pericium aranaceus, and they looked at its activity in mice. And this is important. And we're gonna talk about how we test compounds, what are the, what's the context of these different kinds of assays. This paper describes a mouse assay. It's not just cells in a dish, that's significant. And what they found was that when they fed an extract that contained this compound, aranacine A, that's this compound here, to, excuse me, two mice, they found that their depressive-like behavior was reversed and was accompanied by the modulation of monomine neurotransmitters as well as pro-inflammatory cytokines and regulation of brain-derived neurotrophic factor patterns. This is the important part. Therefore, aranacine A-enriched Pericium aranaceus mycelium could be an attractive agent for the treatment of depressive disorders. So, I think it's papers like this that have led to some of the high interest in species like Pericium and their potential medicinal effects. But something that's important, and we're gonna talk about this more when we talk about the Chaga project, is that it's important to think about the context of how these compounds were tested, how much compound they tested, and how that amount would translate to a human. So they're testing in mice, but you can do these calculations and figure out if you wanted to see a similar effect in a human, how much extract or how much fungus would that take? So I've been talking a little bit about these assays and in my lab, we mostly test for antimicrobial activity. One of the reasons is that it's really common so microbes in the wild are often producing antibiotics, antifungals, antiparasitics. It's pretty straightforward to test for these kinds of activities in the lab. Um, and so we test for all of these basically killing activities or growth inhibiting activities. We also do testing against cancer cells. That's also pretty straightforward. Testing cancer cells in a dish. You can look for compounds or extracts that stop cancer cells from rapidly dividing. But there are lots of other important human diseases for which many people are interested in fungal natural products. And these are just a few of them. So neurological disease is a really big one. Hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol. The statins, the statin drugs were first discovered from a fungus inflammation and immunomodulate. So these are all very complicated human diseases. And you know none of these are any one disease. These are um, systems that are common to multiple diseases. So now I wanna move into our Chaga project. And the Chaga project is, is a project that is ongoing. The Herisian project was published, and so that, that one's complete. Um, and I know that many, most of you, all of you are Chaga fans, and you know all about Chaga, but I want to give you just a little bit of background. So Chaga conchs, shown here and here, are produced after infection of usually birch trees, but other species as well, with the fungus Inonotus obliquus. Um, usually we see just this, this conch part, which is a sterile mycelium structure. Rarely, um, people have observed the sexual stage of chaga, which is shown in this photograph here. And so this is a, uh, the Basidio scarp 
uh, sorry, the city of carp uh, polypore surface just under the surface of the, of the bark of the tree. Chaga is highly valued as a medicinal product, and it has been used traditionally by First Nations people, by indigenous people. It's used in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's been used in Northern Europe for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and in, um, throughout Asia as well. So there's a long, long history of using chaga for just about everything. And that's sort of the fascinating part to me is that people claim that it has activity against, well, everything, it's antimicrobial. It helps, it like sharpens your wit. It uh, helps your memory. It helps uh, stomach issues. It cures cancer. Um, it has a lot of activity. Some of the most dominant and most studied compounds from chaga are shown here. Betulinic acid, it's most well known for its antiviral activity. Interfungin B is a, a, a pretty potent antioxidant compound, and hispidin is both an anti-tumor compound and an antioxidant. Chaga is notable because it, these conks grow very slow. So it might take 10 to 15 years before you would see something about this size. Um, in Minnesota, the state parks have banned the collection of chaga. You can, well, for now, you can collect all other mushrooms, but you cannot collect chaga um, because so much damage has been done to birch trees with people having spiked shoes and trying to climb these trees. However, Bob Blanchett likes to remind me that once you see these conks, the tree is doomed. It is a white heart rot. And by the time these chagas form, then the entire heartwood of that tree is fully infected. So the tree is not long for the world um, anyway. However, that being said, um, there's a need for having a more sustainable source of chaga and for these compounds. I know you can't see any of these structures and that's okay. Uh, this is from a review article uh, published a few years ago. This is not even all the compounds that have been isolated from chaga. This is just, these are just the terpenes from chaga. Chaga is incredibly rich with secondary metabolites. I would argue that most other fungi are equally as rich, but perhaps not as well studied. But many, many people have studied chaga in all forms, both the conks and cultivated chaga. So now I want to talk about some of the considerations that you can use if you want to look up a scientific paper and see, you know, what, what is published about the anti-cancer activity of a compound or of a fungus, or, you know, what systems has this been studied in? And this is just, this table is ginormous. This is from the same review article, um, but I just want to point out a few of the pieces that you can hone in on to get some information. So for example, for bioactivity, um, if it says anti-proliferation activity, that generally means anti-cancer. Um, depending on what assay they use, chances are it, they, they used a cell-based assay. So for example, here's an anti-proliferation assay and they tested it here against human lung cancer cells. These are human lung cancer cells grown in a dish. That's important because that's not necessarily tested in an animal or in certainly in a human. That doesn't mean that it's not effective against cancers in whole animals, but this is just one very early activity. So some of the other things that you would wanna look for are did they test it in a non-cancer cell line? Because if you were looking for something that truly had anti-cancer activity, you would want something that stopped cancer cells from dividing, but didn't stop all of your other cells from dividing, because that would be terrible. Um, and that's one of the reasons why cancer treatments tend to be so toxic, because they generally just stop rapidly dividing cells from growing. And so your hair follicles used to divide a lot, but when you take these anti-cancer drugs, they can't have your hair follicles. Same with your stomach lining. So your stomach lining is 
very rapidly divide in cells. But if you are stopping that from happening, then you can develop these other side effects. So the other thing to think about is concentration. So a lot of times you can publish a paper and you can just say that something was bioactive at such and such concentration. But an important question is to think about, is that concentration clinically relevant or ecologically relevant? Whatever your question is, just because you tested something at a very high concentration doesn't mean that that would translate to, you know, taking a, a heresium tea in a tea bag that is, you know, three grams of product. It might, but not necessarily. So these concentrations are important to pay attention to, to, to look at how potent, how active a compound is. So some of our questions with for chaga are here. Does cultivated chaga isolated from different geographic regions produce different chemical compounds? And do they have different activities? And so chaga is found throughout North America, Europe, Asia, all these cold places. Uh, we have questions about whether if we collected a chaga sample from Alaska versus Minnesota, would they produce the same chemical compounds? Would they produce the same activities? And can we replicate the production of the most bioactive constituents found in wild chaga conks in cultures in the lab? And so this is the same kind of analysis I showed you earlier, where we look at an extract and just basically look at individual peaks to see if something's the same, if something's different, how complex is it at a chemical? So this is an extract of just birch chips. So we grew the chaga on birch since that's how it's generally found in the wild. And then we inoculated birch chips with chaga collected from Cloquet, Minnesota, and also with chaga collected from Alaska. And what you can see in this slide is that the two strains of chaga that we inoculated these specific cultures with are nearly identical. So even they were collected very far apart, their chemical constituents appear to be almost exactly the same under our culture conditions, right? So that's a very important caveat. This is a, a, um, this is a slightly different um, extraction method. And so this one is made with water, hot water, the way you would make a chaga tea. This one was made with a, a solvent. So if you were to make like an ethanolic um, tincture, something like that, you can see that there are some, probably some peaks that are in common and there are some peaks that are different. So depending on how you prepare your extract, your tea, your tincture, your, you know, whatever, it is, however you're going to consume your fungus materials, it's going to, it's going to have a, a great effect on what chemical compounds are extracted out of that material. The question in the chat was mm -hmm. asking, what is the y-axis on your grid? Oh, the y-axis is just the intensity of the signal. And then another way that we can look at extracts before purifying them is to use a technique called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So it's kind of like, it's, it's the same technology that you use for getting an MRI on the body. We can use the same kind of technology on individual compounds and on extracts. So in this slide, I'm showing an extract of chaga that was collected in Alaska. And the bottom one is chaga that was cultivated in the lab from chaga collected in Alaska. So mycelial extract, natural chaga complex. And this image is showing me the NMR spectra. And the only thing that you need to notice is that they're different. The wild collected chaga conch extract is much more complex. And particularly down in this region, under the red circle, you can see a lot more peaks. It just means that there's, there's more different kinds of secondary metabolites from the comp versus the mycelia that we grew in the lab. 
Now, I'm not going to show this data because it's, it's a little complicated, but we have since purified this extract and we've purified lots of terpenes out of it that are present in the conch. So you can't see them here. Let me do that right here. There's these tiny little piece. So there are compounds there that also exist in the conch, but the conch has higher concentrations of them. So we're still working on this project, and we're still interested in these regional differences in mostly antimicrobial and anti-cancer activities. We're going to start testing them for their effects on oxidative stress of human cells. We're testing for their effects on the immune system in a dish, not actually on a, an intact immune system. And we're also working with Swati Moray, who's in the Center for Drug Design, where I work. And she's going to be testing some of our extracts and compounds in mice and to look at their possible effects on uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease models. So there are a lot of mushroom um, materials and products in the stores that you can purchase. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming. I know there's a lot of interest from the members here in you know, consuming medicinal fungi, um, learning more about medicinal fungi. And this is just a small smattering of what you can find on the shelves. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, if something says that it is scientifically verified, it can be worthwhile to look that up. What does it mean to be scientifically verified? For example, if something says it is antimicrobial, that sounds good and you know, microbes are bad, they're not actually at all. Do you want to be consuming antimicrobials? Do you want to be consuming antimicrobials that might be non-discriminating? Or do you want to be consuming antimicrobials that are not at a clinically relevant concentration? Or they might be. It's tricky to evaluate whether something is scientifically verified, but you see it all the time on products like this. And just some final thoughts on medicinal mushrooms generally. Many if not most, all mushrooms produce compounds that have never been isolated, never been characterized, never been tested. So there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of things to discover. Importantly, mushrooms always contain mixtures of compounds. There's, there's no example of a fungus that only contains a single bioactive compound. Nature produces metabolites as sweets of related compounds and multiple unrelated suites of compounds. These, these compounds can interact with each other or not. They can antagonize each other. They can have synergistic effects with each other. Um, you could have a compound that is really useful. You could have an anti-cancer compound. And at the same time, you could have something that is super toxic produced by the same organism. That happens all the time. We know for sure that mycelia and fruiting bodies will contain different compounds and that culture conditions can have a dramatic influence on their chemistry. And finally, the nutraceutical industry is not regulated. I want to acknowledge the people who did this research. In my lab, Yudi Rusman and Song uh, were the chemists who did this work. Francois was one of the fungal biologists and he worked in the lab with Claudia Schmidt-Danner here at the university. Uh, we worked very closely with the DNR and getting access to state parks. Um, and we got all the right permits for collecting in county parks, which is I know hard if you're trying to collect uh, mushrooms. Uh, we have funding from a variety of sources. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. But before, before we move to questions, I just want to throw this out to MMS membership. 
Um, I'm a long-standing volunteer at the Friends School of Minnesota plant sale. Have any of you been to the plant sale, the Friends plant sale? It's the largest weekend long plant sale in the entire United States. It's held over Mother's Day weekend, so it'll be May 12th and 14th. It's at the grandstand, so we take up the entire grandstand plus the area in front of the grandstand. Um, and we have hundreds of thousands of plants, lots of plants that are grown exclusively for us from local growers. The reason I'm telling you about this, not just because plant people overlap with mushroom people pretty closely, but because we're looking for volunteers to help us in the mushroom area of our sale. So a couple of years ago, we started selling these kits. We sell these you know, bags, we sell logs for um, pretty basic um, cultivation systems, um, oyster mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, uh, wine caps. And there are so many questions. People have so many questions about mushrooms. And I'm like just a, a, a newbie home mushroom grower. So people are always radioing me and asking me for advice and help with questions. But we think we, we want people to stand next to these kits to help answer questions. If you have a one, a single four hour volunteer shift over the weekend, you get a golden ticket, which allows you to shop at the sale before we open to the public. So it's a really good deal. And when you answer people's questions, you could tell them about the MMS and say, if you'd like to learn more, you should set, come and join our society. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Christine. Yeah. So actually, I have two questions specifically about Chaga. One is, what have you learned about how long a chaga specimen is actually bioactive. I don't know what else oh. to, to call it. I mean, you know, once you harvest it, what, how long do you have to utilize it to get benefits? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, but it's important. And it's related to another question that I have, which is, does it matter when you harvest the chaga? Because you hear all kinds of people who will say, you have to harvest it only in the winter time. It has to be below, you know, whatever temperature. And some people are like, it doesn't matter. You can harvest it any other time of year. And that's a testable question. And it's related to that as well. So I'm gonna have to think about that. My second question is, uh, the charts that you showed with the various activity level or you know effect, effectiveness for certain things is there a way for us having looked at the chart to tell which of those are for a an infusion like a, a water soluble and which ones are alcohol soluble are you talking about the chart with yes. the activities like it's anti-proliferative yeah the one that showed that I have prostate cancer. That's why I care about it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I have a lot of chaga. I drink chaga. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so let's see if they have that here. So this particular table is for individual pure compounds. Yes. There are certainly similar examples for extracts which may or may not be enriched in any of these hundreds of compounds. So it's, it's a little bit complicated, but you could definitely find examples in the scientific literature where people have tested different kinds of extracts made under different conditions. Hot water extract, alcohol tincture, um, cold water you know, extraction over a long period of time. I think that those all exist but it takes some parsing of the literature. Thank you. I have a question and I have a, um, a comment from the chat, which is, I think a mushroom joke. 
what would you call a Mongolic tribe leader who's also an advocate for medicinal teas derived from groves on birch, birch trees? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> Chaga Khan. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> my question is have you tested any um compounds from chaga grown on ironwood no but i'd be interested in that. yeah we found one um up near cable and actually kind of tasted it made tea from it and it tasted completely different mm. and i would guess that it and i know they're the same family but i i'm sure there's some compounds that would be missing if it wasn't done first. Yeah. So bet the betulanic acid derivatives for sure are, you know, come from the birch itself. And I have no idea if ironwood has similar precursors. But yeah, that would be interesting to compare. With the differences between uh, paper birch and yellow. Right. Yeah. I found it on yellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Question on the, on the chaga extractions. If you're doing it from the uh, wild harvest, did you notice differences in the butylic acid and the uh, birch confer any additional uh, compound versus the uh, birch chips? Yeah, so we didn't purify those extracts yet. So we don't yet know the individual components of the chaga conch extract. All we have is that chromatogram where we can look at how complicated and how different it is and we have that nmr spectrum which tells us we have an idea of the class of compounds we know there's there's terpenes which chaga is known to be very rich in but we don't know exactly which ones so i i can't answer that question yet so there's kind of the argument mycelium has in fact the best bond in sterile compounds right and what we showed so far, with our very basic experiments, is that they are different. They're chemically different. Biologically, we haven't compared them yet. So we don't know if functionally they're equivalent. What I'm interested in is thinking about the individual components. Like if you want to look for a compound that has anti-cancer activity or part of the extract that has specific anti-cancer activity, could we then tune our culture? To, to upregulate those particular compounds. We're not, I don't think we will ever fully replicate the chemistry and activity of a conch versus a mycelial culture. The conch is much more complex. Well, yeah, that kind of comes back to what you're saying. The pharmaceutical industry isn't regulated because a lot of the chaga out there was they ran grown on brown rice right. and extracted from that. Um, I guess I am just curious. Prefer the wild. And I have another question just real quickly on the Wait, second. Can you repeat the nature of the first question and then can you say your next question much, much louder? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Essentially the difference between well harvested and the mycelium and the uh, chemical activity. And yeah, it's a really good point. And it's something that I struggle with when I see these products and it says, you know, herbicium, but maybe it was a mycelial culture grown on rice or grown on oats or, grown, you know, probably not even grown on Cheerios. <laughs> <laughs> Name branch ingredients, right? It's drastically different. I mean, and it, and it makes it it makes for an incredible playground. But at the same time, I feel like nutraceutical manufacturers could be more forthcoming about how they produced those materials and what they exactly know about. Just one, one more question on the <laughs> on the secondary tabulate and your erinacine. Erinacine? Erinacine. You're saying your that extraction is more prevalent in mycelium than a free body? 
under our culture conditions. Christine? Yes. Could you repeat the question? The Zoom audience can't hear those, what this person is saying. Yes. The question was, um, do we find greater concentrations of the arenosines, which are some of the active components of heresium, in our cultures? And my response is that under our conditions in our cultures, we find a single arenosine compound. It doesn't mean that there aren't others in very tiny quantities. We were only able to isolate a single aranasum, aranasum E, whereas most of those bioactivity papers talk about aranasum A. Aranasum E has some really interesting biological activities. It seems to bind to certain um, opioid receptors in the brain, um, but that's a different activity than some of the other compounds. So in our system, under our conditions, we see more of that one aranasum, but not the others. And that's not to say that if we grew it for twice as long or under a different temperature or we shook it instead of keeping it static, that we might produce different things. We haven't done those. But it's all made in the mycelium, not Yes, but that was from our weird heresium that doesn't, isn't yet described. <laughs> so it's not an Aranaceus and it's not an Americanum and we don't know what it is. That fruiting body at that age of growth did not have any Aranaceums in it. But maybe a young one would. We don't know. Yes. Yeah, um, so I guess my question is kind of related to all of this, where you know I'd expect all of these antifungals and antibacterial compounds to be um, only expressed in the presence of those um, competitors, for lack of a better word. Are there lab models for co-culturing, you know, with other fungal agents present, present, other bacterial agents present, and what it was? Okay, that's a great question. I'm going to repeat it for our Zoom audience so you can see if I got it right. Um, one of our audience members said that they would expect that antimicrobials, antifungals, antibacterials would probably most likely be upregulated and produced only in the presence of those competitors or, you know, competing microbes. And is there a lab system model to replicate those kinds of co-cultures? Absolutely, yes. It's complicated, uh, as all, you know, mixed um, communities are. Uh, we've done some work where we um, will co-inoculate like a Petri dish. And um, many of you have probably done this where you've seen, you know, you have a pure culture and it gets contaminated and suddenly you see a pigment form. And if you separate those two microbes so that they're pure, that pigment isn't even produced. And there's lots of compounds that aren't colored that are upregulated when they're in contact with each other. So absolutely, yes. It's hard to like tease apart who's making what in those situations. Um, a lot of people are studying the genetics of these systems. So at the transcriptional level, they're studying you know, what gets upregulated or downregulated in the presence or absence of different pairs or even more complicated. You can imagine a whole microbial community um, being amenable to making lots of compounds we would never see in pure culture. But fortunately, they still make stuff in, in pure culture. Um, and that's super handy for us. Howard had a question from the um, Zoom audience. And he said, what is the chaga kong and how is it made? I think he means in culture. Basically, I had the same question. So it, it's you made a comment that it's mycelial, mm -hmm. but it's a sterile cop. Can you explain that further? What the cop actually that chaga thing is? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, I cannot because I'm 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 not like full blown like fungal biologist. My understanding is that it's a mycelial mass that's also melanized, so that's why it has this dark color. Um, it also is very rich in polysaccharides. So there's something about that structure that's unique and it's very different 
than the mycelia in my cultures on Cheerios or on a Petri dish. They're both mycelial, but very different structurally. So you, were, you didn't get a fruiting body? No. Okay. No, and you wouldn't call a conch a fruiting body because it's sterile. Right. But the definitional difference? Maybe. <laughs> I would guess yes. Yeah. I'm hearing this follow up as a um, question. So when you were showing the one slide that said it was an intellectual stage, how can it be sterile? So that's way back. It's such it's such a cool image. Because it's not because that's a product, not the con. You look at that. Picture. So this is the conch. That's just a mass of sterile mycelia and a bunch of other stuff. And then this is like the, uh, the bark of a fully infected tree that has like exploded. And then this pore surface with the actual sexual form of the fungus is here. This is very rare. Something I learned in reading about this for today's presentation is that this polypore structure here is one of the fastest to be consumed by insects of all known fungi, which is probably why you never see it. Wow. And so it's only been observed a few times. Um, the first published uh, form was like in 1938 or something like that. Um, this is a very rare like photograph. This was in Fungi Magazine. I have heard that it's extremely short lived, but I never heard the reason. But being consumed by insects makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So why? Like why? Why does it? Does it want insects to eat it? Like, do they help spread the spores? Likely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Maybe it's delicious. I was curious about you were talking about the Alaska chaga and the your Bay chaga having close to the same compound, mm -hmm. and like I would think they'd be totally different, yeah, from different environments, yeah. So, like I always learned that you should harvest your chaga from away from pollutants. You know what I mean? Does that kind of put that thought to waste? No. Can you repeat what you said? Yes, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question was, um, someone thought that they were surprised about the result that extracts from geographically separated chaga conchs were so similar. And related to that, they thought that they should collect chaga conchs away from like polluted areas and do my results sort of uh, negate that concern. I would say, no, my results do not negate that concern at all because we were looking at cultures of those two conchs. So we collected conchs from Alaska, conchs from Cloquet, cultured them in the lab under the same conditions. So there was almost none of the original material, the, the conchs themselves. We were just looking at the mycelial cultures grown under identical conditions. But I, I was surprised by that result. I thought that we would see some minor differences, but we see virtually none. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I have to ask the biology people. I'm on Zoom. Can I just check? Can you hear me if I were to ask a question? Let me answer the Zoom one first. Yes. Okay. I'm just curious. So when you talk about the chemical compounds that were isolated, I'm assuming since you're only identifying them from a chromatogram, those compounds are compounds that have been studied in isolation um, elsewhere. Are you referring to the compounds that we isolate and identify? Right. So you're not testing those compounds. You're simply identifying them as a constituent. No, we, them. well, for the experiments where we were comparing like geographically separated things, we were just looking at 
you know, gross differences. But when we really want to study like the herisium, the unusual herisium species, and we want to know exactly what it's making, we describe completely new compounds that have never been dis- never been published, never been described ever. And so we, we purify them and do the whole structure characterization. And we don't compare to things that have been published necessarily. Okay. So, so with that, with that compound, if, if you're identifying that as anti-inflammatory or something like that, those are properties that you're testing and identifying from, from the compound extracted from, from the, um, Herisium mycelium then? I'm kind of, I kind of where I'm going with this is, so are we finding new compounds that potentially could be extracted and synthesized, or are we finding compounds that have been identified as having those properties by completely independent processes, and we just know that they're part of the um, part of the herisium mycelium? When I'm referring to the chemistry that we're doing in my lab, we're we're looking for things that have been already described, both the structure and the activities, and we're describing completely new compounds and testing them independently. But I can't test for everything. So that's a really important caveat, right? So just because we find something that's antifungal doesn't mean that it doesn't have an effect on diabetes. I don't assay for diabetes activity. It doesn't mean it's not there, but natural products are produced in very tiny quantities. So we sort of have to pick and choose our assays. So we do antioxidant assays, cytotoxic, anti-cancer, antimicrobial, but that's mostly it. Antiparasitics. Um, so we would, we would, publish those specific kinds of data. I'm sorry, you're muted. Sorry, um, someone was referring earlier to consuming extracts as being a crapshoot. So if you're consuming an extract or tincture, even even if you created it, you're consuming a whole bunch of different compounds. So ultimately, if you can identify the properties of individual compounds and if those could be extracted, that would be a much more controlled way of of determining the benefit eventually. Yeah, that's a great point. And I wanna push back against that a little bit. So certainly from a scientific standpoint, purifying the individual components, identifying them, testing each individual one, that's what we do. But in, in reality, these things exist as mixtures. Nature produces them as mixtures. We don't ever know why exactly they're produced in nature. And so I can imagine that there are relationships between these compounds that we can't even begin to test in an analogous way. And so, yes, it can be a crapshoot to take a, a tea bag of, you know, herisium and try to you know, get its medicinal benefits. But at the same time, I think there's just so much unknown that we haven't even begun to look for or test for. So there could even be synergies between those compounds that we don't understand. Absolutely. And people are studying synergy, but it's, it's complicated because it involves mixtures of things. 